All right. Uh, good uh, morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you here. Great that you uh, found uh, your way all the way through uh, all the highway, uh, always. So uh, it's good to see you. Um, we we'll also have, uh, before I forget afterwards, uh, some uh, some pins here that you can pick up. So uh, it's it's worth it staying for the entire session for sure. Um, yeah, so today, uh, maybe you've participated already in another session or going to later on, it's sustainability at FU. It's the first time uh, that we organize a full day of activities. Uh, this day started as the birthday of the Green Office, which is actually celebrating its uh, 10, no, 8th birthday this year. Uh, so it's been quite a while since then, a, long has, a lot has happened and developed and uh, also the uh, Amsterdam Sustainability Institute came into existence, for example. So uh, yeah, we're celebrating that and inviting everybody to join, uh, not only today, but also in the future, all the different initiatives that they are. Um, so uh, I wanted to just uh, to show you one of the uh, ways to, um, to do that. Um, so uh, as part of the sustainability office, which is again, another unit in FU, uh, there's a green ambassador network uh, being set up at the moment, which you are warmly invited to join. Uh, anyone can join, researchers, uh, staff, uh, support staff. Um, the idea is to have links into all parts of the university of people who are interested in sustainability and want to make a change and also meet like-minded people because that can also be very energizing. Um, so you also find some papers uh, somewhere outside there to sign up um, and you can always also approach the uh, sustainability office and you find the contact details in the, on the website. So um, yeah, this is um, what you can do if you want to stay involved after this day. Uh, and there's also loads of other initiatives as I already mentioned. Um, sometimes difficult to keep an overview, but um, yeah, we have something for students, we have some things for researchers, students and staff to work together on cases. Uh, we have us, the ASI, where you uh, can join as a researcher to either collaborate with other researchers in uh, research clusters, for example, or apply for small research grants. And the sustainability office, which is mainly concerned with uh, implementing sustainability in the organization. So you can think of the curricula, or um, practices on uh, in, in operations. So uh, yeah, with that, uh, I will just pass the to, 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 to Philip to uh, yeah tell a bit more about what we're actually going to do here in this right. spe session, especially. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Nele. Good. Uh, so yeah, what are we doing actually in the session? So first of all, nice to see you. It's a great pleasure. This is part of the Sustainability Day at FU, as Nela has explained, so this is nice. It will be a fantastic um, presentation. We have actually two, and I will introduce the speakers in a second, and you can ask questions. Um, it is also, and that's why I'm very proud, actually, a launch of a new initiative, another one, at FU, in which is our Climate Expertise Center. So formally, I will open it later. I'm not sure what I will do. I'm not sure what I can press, but I will do that later. So it's not formally open, but just going to mention that we will have it, a center, where we bring together all the excellent researchers at the FU that do research on climate change. And that's really many. And I was uh, surprised. I work at FU for 18 years. So I always thought I know everyone, know everything, but I don't. Um, this is really amazing how much is hidden somewhere. And this is a way to bring it all together. Now, why do we do this? Um, I'm not going to give a long lecture. The climate crisis is deepening and it's accelerating. So it's going really not that well. And our political responses are also lagging behind. And I think it's fair to say, I'm not sure if my colleagues would agree, but I think it is that the scientific community has systematically underestimated how quickly climate change is actually hitting us, how severe it is, and it has overestimated our ability to do something about it. And this is really not good. So a recent report by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the international body that wants to address this problem, uh, states that uh, I can recommend that you read it. Three things. First of all, we're nowhere near a 1.5 degree scenario, not even close, right? It also says that there's only a very small and rapidly closing window of opportunity to actually start reducing emissions, probably really just three, four, five years, that's it. And the third conclusion that they draw in this report is what we need is not incremental little change, we need system change. And by the way, these are the governments themselves that say that. So not some 
demonstrators on the street. This is what governments write themselves down and sign it. Okay, so I think this also shows that we are living through extreme times, complex times, times that are uncertain. And this is why I think we need research. We have research. It is really going very well, but sometimes it's really hard to see and find. And that is why we want to have a place where the outside world, this could be the press, could be stakeholders, it could be policymakers, could be just the general public knows where to find us. And not just one person, not just one discipline, not just one faculty, but all faculties and all disciplines together. Because we need to overcome silos and really show the breadth of knowledge that is available, systematic knowledge that we have amassed at FU. And that is why we put all of this together in the Climate Expertise Center. And as I said, I'm really thrilled to do that because it means that we can work together with some of the best people in the world that are super modest and never say that, but they are. And we all have them together and we will have more. And I'm very happy to say that today we have two of them here on stage for you to talk about the climate crisis. Jurin Funk, uh, you will start first. Jurin is an associate professor at the Earth uh, Science Department and uh, talk about permafrost. And I think it's melting, but you will tell us more about it. I'm not sure. Good. And uh, we have Dim Komu. Uh, Dim is a professor of climate extremes. He works both at the Institute for Environmental Studies, also at the Better Faculty, but also affiliated with the Royal Dutch um, Meteorological Institute. I hope that's a correct translation, Kahnemi. Very happy also to have you both. Jurin, you will start. There's room for questions. And then Dim will tell all about climate extremes. And then we have a little debate. And then I will uh, end by formally opening our Climate Expertise Center. Thanks for coming already. It's a great pleasure. Jurin, the floor is yours. Enjoy. Thank you. Let's see if this works. Yes, okay, great. Thanks, Philip, for the introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, that's the short summary of my talk. It uh, melts, actually it thaws because melts is not entirely the right. No, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it covers the same idea, essentially. So you see here two of my group members standing on the uh, Canadian Arctic coast. And of course, this is a pretty impressive image uh, nicely illustrating that, you know, what used to be stable and frozen is actually slowly uh, and sometimes rapidly uh, thawing, slumping and also degrading into greenhouse gases. And it's mostly about the carbon, uh, what we're interested in, uh, in this case. So, a little bit more about what is permafrost, right? Uh, it's simply frozen ground. It doesn't even have to contain ice a little bit of a misconception sometimes, anything below our feet that is continuously frozen. And that could be up to, you know, more than a kilometer deep in uh, Northeast Siberia and Northern Scandinavia here and there, you know, a couple of decimeters or meters. Uh, and it could be peatland, it could be mineral soils, it could be uh, rocks that are just frozen. And the extent is really, the, of course, the Northern Hemisphere a little bit in, in, in higher mountainous areas, but mostly really in the north. Um, and there's different types of permafrost. So there's continuous permafrost, darker colors, uh, and that's just everywhere you drill a hole, it's frozen. Uh, but if you move south slowly, uh, some of the grounds are not frozen anymore, and other places where conditions are better, it is frozen. So then, then it, uh, we call this discontinuous. There's also permafrost on the seafloor, uh, so this used to be land when there was a lot of ice on all continents, sea, sea levels were lower and cold temperatures led to the, 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 the bottoms there to freeze. So there's still remnants of that left uh, that now and then get a lot of attention because of some methane leaks. And I should of course uh, emphasize this, uh, this pool uh, the, the, the frozen soil soils in this area contain at least 25% of all the soil carbon on the planet. 
while it's of course a much smaller region, relatively speaking. So there's a lot of frozen stuff in this freezer. And no surprise, we all know the Netherlands are warming, Europe is warming, but the Arctic is really warming. Uh, we can still talk about this one and a half degree ideal goal up there. It's uh, absolutely not possible anymore. And all the maps you see, they have this, you know, hoovering red color over different parts of the Arctic. Uh, latest estimates are that it's up to four times faster than with us. In my first summer in Siberia, I do remember on, on land, I had been on a ship before, but we essentially wear uh, swimsuits under our bug shirts because it was so warm. I mean, there are of course uh, extreme summers and less extreme summers, but it was an, an interesting first encounter. Um, so there's a lot of physical drivers, right, that are changing or warming uh, because of this warming. It's not just temperature, there's also lots of precipitation changes, not necessarily because there's more permafrost thawing, but just also atmospheric circulation patterns that are different and leading to more precipitation. So on average, more than, or, yeah, more than 9% increase in the last couple of decades. Sea ice is, of course, the most perhaps eye-catching or easy to measure uh, property, physical property. So we, we both see that the extent of sea ice goes down a lot, almost half in the last couple of decades, but also the type of sea ice. So there's much more single layer, like uh, how do you call this? Not multi-year sea ice, but single year sea ice. So something that grows and melts right away and is much more vulnerable to a little bit of warming than a thicker layer of ice. Um, yeah. One of this, these things is of course permafrost. I have not mentioned it here. It's not thawing everywhere, but it is at least warming everywhere. So this is a circumarctic or panarctic study from the 1980s to 2016. Lots of boreholes throughout the Arctic and we see everywhere the temperature is going up. And sometimes, you know, that's from minus 10 to minus seven. So essentially nothing is really changing yet, but you know, you're, you're approaching that zero point and uh, a little bit um, below, then you're already much more vulnerable to extreme summers, for example. Uh, so generally it has been going up since the seventies and we see this as, yeah, all over the place. And this has impact, not just for the climate that we're in, maybe in the Netherlands most interested in, but also for the communities that live there. A couple of years ago, um, we actually didn't know this before, but it's part of a large EU project I'm in. They kind of um, surveyed all the settlements based on permafrost, and it's about 1,200 settlements. Doesn't uh, sound like a lot, but in total, 5 million people. Also doesn't sound like a lot compared to the Netherlands, but about 1 million of them live at the coast and they are yeah, more at risk than uh, some of the other places, although it's, uh, it certainly differs from place to place. And uh, yeah, there's just, it, 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 it doesn't stop the list of impacts they receive. It, it just goes from simple things. They store their, their, all the food they harvest in the summer in holes in the ground to survive the winter. Those holes are not longer um, uh, frozen, so they need to, you know, go deeper or think of alternative solutions. Hunting pathways uh, are, are changing, and it's also their general well-being, right? Here we, we kind of are disconnected from nature. Up there, it's really a one health system. If the, the environment is changing, it impacts their, their, their everything. And environmental, or how do you call this, the, the legal climate justice um, also is kind of happening there. So they, uh, I read this book about um, an Inuit woman. Uh, she, uh, they're trying to, you know, pitch this right to be called. It's their fundamental right to live and thrive in a, in a system that is cold enough. And if that's taken away, somebody should be responsible. Uh, it's not entirely successful yet, but they're certainly getting somewhere with this. And you see here some of the impacts, lots of coastal erosion. This is in Taktiaktuk, where uh, close to the photo on the front page where people in my group uh, go to. Uh, and you see, you know, small houses in Yakutsk. 
kind of not so stable oil pipelines that are, yeah, over all these massive continental scales sinking in. For the countries that do have more money to adapt to climate change, you can actually build an oil pipeline in a way so, so that the cold, uh, you know, keeps on entering the ground and uh, have it sustain and not impact the permafrost. But not everywhere we have that financial um, uh, options, specifically, yeah, specifically not in the wide Siberia. Um, so, um, but yeah, you know, those are the local impacts. Um, they are kind of devastating. But now let's go back to that carbon um, story. So the permafrost carbon feedback is essentially stuff in the ground that warms or and it, it thaws, it goes from below zero to above zero and the carbon starts to decompose. It's not that there's CO2 or methane in the ground itself. Usually it's just carbon that is converted into CO2 or methane, which causes the greenhouse effect to um, yeah, to continue and air temperature to increase. And this again then uh, starts to increase that thaw. So it's a, a cycle. But, you know, what, what can we say about, okay, yes, it's thawing, but can we predict then how much greenhouse gases are coming from the system? There's one vital property, uh, and that is amount of ice in the ground that determines how a landscape will change when it's the, 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 the ground is, is thawing. Uh, soils with low ground ice content, so 20% or less, which is a kind of a normal soil, uh, they show very gradual deepening. So you actually have, you know, the active layer, the layer that thaws uh, is above zero every summer and is frozen again in the winter that starts to deepen slowly every year, a little bit, or some years not, and other years more. And over time, when the heat of the summer is more than the relative cold in the winter, you get this unfrozen layer in the soil. And that kind of keeps the warmth going by itself, also because of microbes, and then it starts to accelerate. But, this, so this, but anyway, this is a gradual process, but it happens on very large scales. One has measured, you know, a sinking of landscape coverage over like a millimeter per year, which doesn't look like a lot, but if you, you know, do that for, that for an entire country, it kind of adds up. But this is the one that is most eye-catching, of course. Permafrost with lots of ice in the ground, up to 90% sometimes. So you can imagine as soon as that stuff melts, your ground collapses. And this is, of course, the coast where you have extra physical drivers eating that material away. But the concept is really that the ice melts and then your landscape collapses. So this is also called thermocarst. <clears throat> and uh, that, that, that looks very dramatic, but a lot of this material may just be redeposited elsewhere. You have this massive debris tongues uh, that, you know, receive all this material and uh, Usually it's quickly buried, so it can't really degrade anymore. But still, of course, it, this influences the landscape a lot. This is on the Peel Plateau in Canada, where we also have worked. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but apart of uh, apart from ground ice, it's also a couple of other factors, and I'm not going to have a whole physical process story here, but. Typically, it's the type of permafrost, the topography, whether it's flat or slopey, that depends, determines where the material can go. And the parent material. So different types of soils also contain different amounts and uh, uh, different types of quality of carbon. So some of them actually can generate a lot of greenhouse gases and others can't or won't. So how big is that feedback then, right? Everybody is usually asking, uh, yeah, so how does it compare to our fossil fuel combustion? Well, that's hard to say, but of course we need to give an estimate. So in the last, uh, IPCC, is it the last? Yeah, I think the IPCC report, they came with this, um, uh, yeah, estimate or calculation. Per one degree global warming, you have actually three to 41 gigaton 
uh, of CO2 from thawing permafrost by 2100. So I think we emit globally about 10 uh, per year. So this looks like, oh, okay, it's not that bad, perhaps, you know, you can round it up, but per one degree. So if we are five or six degrees by 2100, that is already a lot more. And uh, they also try to do this in other ways, like uh, global volume of, of surficial permafrost and, and that aerial extent will decrease. But this is a very conservative estimates, uh, estimate. So this abrupt thaw that happens when you have a lot of ice in the ground uh, is kind of an, an underemphasized type of thaw. We're, we're getting we're, we have more of that information in the last couple of years. And in this study, they show that even though the amount, the area where abrupt thaw happens is smaller than this massive area with little ice in the ground, it may contribute similarly to greenhouse gas release as the larger area that is ice poor. And yeah, and this, these are harder to predict because it's, uh, we don't really know how much ice is in the ground. Uh, globally, um, we'll get back to that later. Anyway, so this is what they predicted, but there are lots of non-linearities. Um, abrupt thaw and things like fire, you know, the impact of a fire or heat summer is also all not included and it really accelerate things. But we do know thaw is unavoidable, even if we would stop emitting now, it will likely, you know, simmer on and for decades or centuries, and most of this is irreversible. You know, this uh, thaw slump that you see here, it's not going to be built up um, pretty easily. But we also know the extent of thaw is up to us. So if we stop emitting or, you know, try to decrease our emissions, the impact on permafrost is certainly less. Uh, so we can, we can certainly be impacted. And this mitigation of thaw is an illusion. There, I mean, you know, we, we can't really impact the system such locally that it that we prevent it from thawing. There are some exotic Siberian experiments going on with you know cutting trees and uh, transforming things into grass grasslands to keep the carbon in the ground, but you can't do that on a continental scale. So it's going to happen anywhere. So it's very simple. I, I'm preaching to the choir here because you all know. Uh, and this was actually uh, published a year ago for another COP meeting coming up. And we have the same idea, of course, as soon. Yeah, we must just must stop emitting uh, to protect these ecosystems. And a few quotes from here is like, yeah, complexity, immensity, remoteness of these ecosystems. It, it's, it's all so far and it's so big and especially now not accessible anymore, like the Siberian Arctic. We, we don't have a clue what's going on and how rapid it will go. It's, it's also more difficult to monitor than sea ice. And the policy implications are clear. The faster we reduce emissions and draw down atmospheric CO2, the more of this permafrost domain we can save. So just to summarize, last slide, what is needed? Reduce emissions, uh, protect ecosystems to actually sustain them uh, to be sinks, because the permafrost domain is still a sink about, yeah, to become a source. And we need a better process understanding because that ground ice that I talked about, we simply don't know. We have very little measurements and it's all based and mapped based on indirect properties. And, and perhaps we should also, as Philip started, you know, communicate more strongly as scientists and tr sometimes try to be bold and not say, yeah, maybe we don't know, but yes, we do know. Uh, the extent is just unclear, but that it's rapidly changing. Yeah, it's obvious. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, good last point also about the science communication, because I think your Instagram account is actually quite an active one, right? So you already yeah, 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 use it. Yeah, true. Yeah. So thank you very much. Are there any direct questions for Jureen? Otherwise, we also have some time afterwards to uh, discuss a little bit what we heard. Yeah, did. 
connect. Yeah. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, so is permafrost now kind of tipping element mm -hmm. in the sense that it's that you expect this abrupt changes and maybe histories of behavior stuff like that, or do you do you think it's it should not be uh, it used to be always mentioned like in, in tipping yeah. points, uh, you know, as a list of one of the tipping points. But the, I think we're slowly moving into a no. Yeah. But I mean, because it's such a huge, fro uh, big, frozen, physical, locally, yes, abrupt. Yeah. Uh, but con on continental scales, it may be a little bit more predictable. So yeah, because it's more thermodynamics and not necessarily a tipping point. Although. Yeah. Philip? Yeah, totally different question. So you mentioned already that probably in the Arctic, this idea of a global average temperature of 1.5 degrees by the end of the century, that should be 1.5, is a bit weird because that's not going to happen. Um, and I think it's good to communicate also this. No one understands probably what an average temperature actually is. But my question is, how do you deal with this also emotionally? If you do research on something that's sort of really changing, that you probably really like in a way, I mean, I can imagine you sort of studying permafrost in the Arctic because you have some form of affiliation. You mentioned, of course, local people, but that might also be true for researchers and <laughs> like the court, I'm not sure. So how do you deal with this, that you see something that is so much changing that it might be hard to recognize? Or is that, or can you extract from that as a researcher and say, no, I'm just making my measurements and... Uh... Yeah, of course, not entirely. And in the beginning, you know, this also changes when I get older in a way, like you see more and more evidence that it, it is just going ridiculously fast and you also build up a relationship with the local people if you can still go there. Um, so yeah, that certainly impacts uh, me and my group, you know, and in the beginning, I know, you know, when they start and they prepare for field work, they're really theoretical. And then when I've been there and sit, have sit in the, that helicopter and flew over the coast where they see got yeah massive blocks going in it suddenly changes like okay shit it's really happening yeah okay no further questions for now then uh Jimmy. I'm gonna do this on the full screen. Yes, you're good. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Eugene. It's a nice, uh, very interesting talk. I was a bit shocked by now uh, Arctic warming four times. That seems to be uh, yeah, upgraded uh, every times. 10 years, too. Started at two times faster, three times. So, uh, yeah, interesting discussion to have, um, you know, whether uh, climate is changing faster than we predicted, as uh, Philip uh, initiated that discussion point. Um, I will come back to that, uh, I think, in my talk at one or two locations. So at least there are some signs that, um, yes, our climate models, and then I'm talking about CMIP-6 climate models, are too conservative when we're talking about extremes. And extremes are ultimately causing the impacts. So uh, yeah, that is certainly a worry. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for, uh, by the way, uh, doing, uh, creating this climate expertise center. I think that is great. I think there's really a lot of great uh, climate science and impact science ongoing at VU. I'm only aware actually at the Earth Science and IVM, but I'm sure it's much broader than that. And I think it would be great if that gets connected more and gets a bit more visibility. So uh, yeah, I'm happy uh, to talk about uh, what we are doing. And basically I would like to give you a bit of a flavor what, uh, what type of research the Climate Extreme team is currently working on. So we care about extremes. It's a lot about the physics. So how is climate change altering um, the climate change, uh, the, the climate system, and creating conditions that creating heat waves and droughts and extreme rainfall events around the globe. So we're looking a lot into um, uh, the, these waves into the jet streams. That is important. 
And interestingly, if you understand that well, you also have, uh, are able to pre predict extremes better. For that, we use uh, AI technologies. Um, it enables us to uh, forecast heat waves uh, several weeks in advance. And that is important, um, of course, for uh, early warning uh, type approaches, and particularly for agriculture. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about how what I consider very big risks for um, agriculture and global food production. No. Yes. Okay, so but before I uh, come to our research, actually, I would like to say a little bit about um, this very dramatic extreme event that um, occurred a couple of weeks ago. So we had this very wavy jet stream situation so, over the Atlantic and Europe, high pressure conditions over France and the Netherlands, which brought that, uh, you know, you had that southerly flow. So you had warm air from the Sahara all the way reaching uh, the Netherlands. So we had actually the, the warmest September week ever was measured uh, at the build, which is uh, where the KNMI um, measuring station is. Um, so very warm conditions here, and then we have these low pressure conditions uh, in Mediterranean regions a bit further south, especially a strong storm system uh, over Greece, and that brought almost a meter of rainfall, that's enormous. That's about uh, the amount that the Netherlands gets in one year. <coughs> and that happened in just a few days, so massive flooding. And then this low pressure system turned into what we call a medicane. A medicane is an, uh, a storm system that extracts its energy from the warm ocean waters. Uh, so, and of course, the, the Mediterranean uh, sea surface temperatures were very warm. And this uh, storm, Daniel, it was called then really intensified on its, uh, on its path towards Libya. And there it really hit, um, you know, at the wrong time, at the wrong place, I would say. And then really caused a disaster. Of course, a very vulnerable country. Two dams collapsed and we had a uh, really total disaster. So, of course, question is, how is uh, climate change affecting these type, of, uh, these type of extremes? And nowadays we have what's called... Um, rapid attribution studies, where people do rapid analysis of climate observational data and climate model data. I want to say something about uh, what is the role for this particular event, in this case, this storm system. Uh, what is the role of climate change on that? And well, we've had such study um, stating that the Libya flooding made up to 50 times more likely. To be honest, I'm a bit critical about these studies. Right, so I wouldn't uh, put too much focus on that number 50. It gives a level of certain that that looks like a level of certainty that we really do not have. But it's clear that these type of extremes are strongly amplifying with climate change. And it is simply due to warming. Uh, the air is getting warmer. That means that heat waves uh, will be more intense and it will, will also mean that rainfall extremes will be more intense. Uh, the reason is warmer air holds more water vapor or can hold more water vapor. And therefore, when, when it rains out, it can be uh, much more heavy. Very striking. The month of September was extremely warm. So this is uh, on uh, the global average, and it's honestly a quite shocking graph. Now, of course, we very well understand uh, the warming since the 1940s up till uh, today, huh? that long-term warming of about one degree C. Um, currently, we also have an El Nino event developing, which can explain a little bit more of extra warming, but that's of the order of 0 0.1 degree C on the global average. So I would still have accepted <laughs> a temperature uh, in September about uh, this value, but we're jumping really way up and this is something that is uh, truly worrying me and many climate scientists around the globe because basically we don't fully understand what is going on. And this is, well, this is shows the time series for monthly mean temperatures in September. But this has been developing uh, already over the whole of uh, 2023. And we're certainly going to um, a global mean record temperature by the end of the year. 
and certainly also 2024, because then El Nino will be fully developed. So yeah, and that's uh, maybe linking a little bit to what uh, Philip initiated. This is a big surprise for climate scientists. We didn't see this coming. We don't really fully understand it, and that should worry us. I've seen such surprises when it comes to extremes. For example, the Canadian heat wave a couple of years ago hitting almost 50 degrees as 50 degrees latitude. That came as a surprise. Uh, but then you're talking about heat uh, in a couple of weeks in a, in a uh, fairly confined region. But this is really global mean temperatures. That in a way should not surprise us what it does. Okay, so warming is um, and intensifying these type of extremes, but uh, we're also very much interested, of course, how uh, these waves in the in the jet stream are changing. That's actually a core focus of uh, our research group. And in a very recent paper, should come out uh, soon. Uh, we look, we actually identified this type of pattern where we have high pressure over Western Europe and low pressure directly offshore. And this pattern has increased over the last 50 years. So we see this more frequently and it is bringing uh, exactly this type of flow situations. Uh, so southerly flow, warm air from the Sahara, heating up France uh, and the Netherlands. And therefore we see um, that heat extremes, and these are uh, here measured in the warmest day of the year, have been warming very fast in Western Europe. And so this is the trend in the warmest day of the year, and this is in degree C per uh, global warming degree. So basically uh, one degree means uh, the region has been warming as fast as the global mean temperature but it's going much faster. Right? So these extremes are warming, go much faster than uh, global mean values. And there's a, there's a number of feedbacks that play a role here. And also this is playing a role. Uh, we see more of the circulation patterns that create these heat waves. And the CMIC-6 models really do not see these type of dynamical changes. So we don't, uh, that is something uh, we don't understand. And that's why CMIP-6 models underestimate the observed trend in heat waves over Western Europe. This is the case for Western Europe. And there are a couple of other regions where we see similar effects happening. By the way, feel free to uh, interrupt me if anything is unclear. But, uh, okay. So that, um, so I was looking there at more a regional pers pers perspective uh, at Europe. Um, one can also take an hemispheric perspective because we know that these type of uh, waves in the jet stream, they can become circumglobal, as you see here. So this shows a snapshot uh, of July uh, 2018. So very wavy jet stream pattern, also very persistent. Uh, so these, these type of patterns can last for several weeks and then they can create heat waves simultaneously in different regions uh, around the hemisphere. And that creates particular risk for um, agriculture because in many regions throughout the Northern hemisphere, we have these, what we call bread baskets. So that's where most of our global food production is taking place. Uh, the US Midwest, famous one, of course, France, Ukraine, Russia, and also further uh, the Far East. And whenever we have these waves, they can cause simultaneous heat waves and agricultural losses simultaneously in uh, multiple bread baskets. So this is a bit older study where we analyzed these wave and we identified identify what we call a wave five pattern. And so five times around the globe and a wave seven pattern. And those are very important whenever they grow in amplitude they can become uh, persistent and then cause heat waves in these uh, reddish colored regions. And yeah, we actually did some statistics on that. And there's, uh, whenever these waves are dominant during the summer, there's a 24 increase in the chance of simultaneous heat waves. And we can actually trace it back into the crop data. So you can see that signal. And a classic example has been um, the summer of 2010, 
which was dominated by what we call wave five activity. And you can see that also when you look at the, the July mean 2010 temperatures. And so you basically see that these regions were anomalously warm. So with a very severe heat wave in Russia, Ukraine, and that basically caused the harvest failure there. Also, the US had a relatively poor harvest as well as the East Asia. And that, of course, then uh, triggers, uh, that can trigger food price spikes. And of course, export bans and speculation start playing a role then. And when the, the harvest failed in Russia, mm -hmm. Russia actually imposed an export ban, uh, feed the young population first. But that, of course, then creates problems on global markets. And we had a huge price in, uh, in uh, this FAO food price index. There has been uh, quite some work actually linking this to the Arab Spring, right? Uh, directly 2011, uh, the very high food prices in Northern Africa and Middle East triggered, was one of the important triggers for uh, the Arab Spring. Of course, many of these countries are very dependent on imports and therefore they're dependent on prices on the global markets. Okay, so also very important and interesting uh, crop is soybean. Uh, so also one of the, the major uh, staple crops. So in terms of kilocalorie, it's only second to wheat, but in terms of uh, financial volume, it's actually first globally. And what it makes it so interesting it, uh, is that 80% uh, of global production is done in only three countries, the US, uh, Brazil, and Argentina. That of course makes it uh, very vulnerable, right? If we have heat waves and droughts um, hitting these bread baskets simultaneously in uh, one or two of these bread baskets, then you immediately have a problem. And that's actually what happened in 2012, which you see here. So really a, a drastic drop in production of soybean and, and Brazil, United States, and Argentina all did poorly. And that then, uh, of course, you know, amplified the prices on the global markets. So what was going on in 2012? Well, very important is that what we had a persistent La Nina conditions, as you can see here. So this shows the ENSO index, El Nino Southern Oscillation. This basically captures whether, whether the, the warmest sea surface temperatures are over the West Pacific during La Ninas or more uh, over the East Pacific during El Nino events. Uh, right now we move to an El Nino. So from 2010 up till uh, 2012, 2013, we were in persistent La Nina conditions. So really the warmest ocean waters were direct, directly offshore uh, Indonesia. And that creates waves, uh, so-called Rossby waves, but they can really, um, affect remote regions, in particular Eastern US and also uh, Southern America, and then creating these drought conditions and um, poor harvests, as you can see here with these purple cores. So we wanted to understand that better and really kind of attribute what is the role of climate change on the, on the crop failures. And for that we used um, it's a so-called storyline approach. What you do here is you basically reproduce the atmospheric circulation in a climate model as it was observed in 2012. Uh, we have some techniques to do that. And then you also reproduce the drought conditions, as you can see here. Uh, so this shows soil moisture in the, in the different bread baskets. And then you can do the same exercise in a pre-industrial climate and in a, in a two degrees C warmer climate. Right, so you again reproduce the drought, uh, which means the same type of uh, large scale atmospheric circulation. And what you basically see is that the drought in, in the different bread baskets is quite similar. So climate change does not have a strong influence on drought conditions in terms of soil moisture. But of course, the climate is warmer. Right? So of course, the US is substantially warmer in the two degrees C warmer world in summer. 
And what that means is that the crop impacts are much more substantial uh, because the crops are much more vulnerable to a drought when temperatures are higher. And that's basically what you see here. Uh, so the production losses in 2012 um, in a pre-industrial and in a two degree C warmer world. So as a rule of thumb, you can say production losses roughly double with every degree C of warmer. It's always good, by the way, to highlight here that we are really isolating the climate effect. Uh, of course, there's uh, tons of other factors that play a role um, in global in, uh, in soybean production, eh? management, uh, production area, etc. And those have, of course, really increased over this period. But that we're not looking at. And we're simply reproducing what if this event would have happened in a pre-industrial climate. Uh, in, in a, a world like today. We have some time still? Okay. Okay, now if you, uh, if we understand these, these Taylor connections better, then we can also use that um, to forecast heat waves and also to forecast uh, soybean production or more generally uh, crop harvest. And we've done that uh, in this series of studies so here we really uh, focused in on uh, the Eastern US and soybean. And what we show is basically that heat waves in these regions are related to such type of wave, pa wave pattern. And that's get initiated by what we call a horseshoe uh, shaped SST pattern, sea surface temperature pattern in the Pacific. So whenever this pattern is present, that tends to initiate these type of waves and then causing heat waves in the eastern US, and that can cause harvest failures. And of course, uh, sea surface temperature patterns, uh, that's, that's a much more slower uh, changing variable as compared to atmospheric variables. So this can give you predictability on seasonal time scales. Uh, so what we actually show here is that we can do skillful forecast of soybean harvest three months prior to sowing. So actually in February, we can always say, this is likely to be a, a bad year for uh, soybeans, for example. And yeah, you can uh, identify these patterns with AI, different type of AI methods uh, really well. And I think that's, that is really a, a very powerful way to improve predictability on, uh, on sub-seasonal and seasonal time scales. And yeah, I'm confident that uh, much more will be done on the, in that direction in the coming years. We actually uh, created a startup company, which is called Beyond Weather, which is really aimed at bringing these, these type of AI forecast to the markets and to society. Focusing is on uh, energy, agriculture, and aid. We have a little project with the food, World Food Programme as well. That's uh, our team. We still need a diversity officer. This is really bad. So, <laughs> white male. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I, I just like to wrap up here. Um, I've, I've mostly talked about uh, the outcomes of our science, uh, and I think, and the biggest risk that I see uh, for society coming from uh, the rising climate extremes. I just want to uh, also share a little bit with you the type of methods that we work with. Uh, of course, big data really gives now uh, big opportunities for climate science uh, to understand better what is going on in the system. Also, because we don't, we cannot fully trust our climate models. Climate models are still super useful tools, but for extremes, you got to be careful. And then uh, these type of more data-driven methods become in, become very handy. And we can address these type of questions. And these are some uh, upcoming projects that we work on. Good. So some takeaway messages for you. Uh, heat waves, extreme rain and drought are increasing with global warming. This is primarily, primarily due to thermodynamics, simple warming. Big open questions is how do dynamical changes uh, play out and how can they amplify extremes? So in Europe, we see that we see a strong increase in this type of uh, weather patterns that create heat waves. Yeah, beware of surprises. Our models are only a vague reflection of the real world. We should not trust them too much. Uh, understanding dynamics paves the way for predictability on seasonal timescales, also using AI and other methods. 
and storylines are helpful uh, dealing with uncertainty. That's and the storyline is that soybean example, uh, multiple bread baskets. Okay, thanks. Hope uh, this was clear. I'm happy to take it. Yes, thank you, Dean. Yep. Very nice. Um, yeah, so we have uh, time for some questions if there are any. Or if you set up any two. Yes. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in AI, but uh, I was wondering to what extent you, because you showed, for instance, the extreme yeah. weather conditions September this year, and uh, this comes as a surprise. So, to what extent do you consider context? In the predictions and uh, when these type of things happen, how do you uh, uh, retune not the prediction based on uh, on the past, but also you understand how can you understand what to change to to consider the, the surprises? Yeah, that's a good question, and that that, that is always uh, quite problematic. Um, so what you do with AI, you first you train on historic data mm -hmm. and then you make hindcast. So you're not really doing a forecast, of course, but you're trying um, to forecast past events. And so you, you, have, uh, you have, this is maybe your data set. You say, I'm going to train on this part of the data set. Uh, I get a trained model and then I'm going to see if I, can, I, if I can probably forecast this part of my data set. Um, that works reasonably well, but then if you're, if you're in a non-stationary system, which we are, then it becomes uh, quickly very difficult. Uh, and certainly if you have then these type of surprises for uh, uh, the, the very warm temperatures in September, then that is something you, you will not be able to forecast. And actually we, uh, with, yeah, with, um, that's the startup company. We, we, what we do is we, on the 8th of the month, we do forecast for Europe. And so 8th of September, we do a forecast for October, November, and December now on that time scale. And we just um, analyzed like how good was our September forecast. So in, then you're doing a real forecast, so not a hindcast, which actually, and our patterns were very good, but the amplitudes were generally way too low. And I think it's indeed because we now have all that heat in the system, especially the North Atlantic is super warm. And that is, uh, and our models uh, are not trained on that. So they don't have that information. So I don't know how, what the solution is yet, but we do see th these type of problems. So you, you close down the, the, the time scale to monitor more in detail, something like that. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, it's yeah, it's, it, it takes, yeah. <laughs> And there was another question here, someone in the front there. Um, your uh, soybean example, of course, uh, is a good example that directly uh, impacts farmers, but how does this uh, climate science reach the people who it directly affects? Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I mean, the typical way is that uh, we have, uh, with many of our projects, we have stakeholders. Uh, and uh, for example, indeed, this um, this soybean work was part was done uh, as part of a uh, big European project. It's called Received, and there were many um, agricultural stakeholders and also other stakeholders involved in that. So you have workshops and you have uh, uh, online webinars, and that, that's generally good discussion and useful. Um, it's still. In my, in my view, uh, it tends to be quite difficult to be really what's called uh, stakeholder driven <laughs> or, or have like changed your research such that it's most useful for the stakeholder because uh, you have kind of as a scientist, you have kind of research questions in mind like this is important to understand <laughs> coming from the science and, and stakeholders uh, think differently. Uh, they have um, different concerns. So that, that tends to be actually quite difficult. But having said that, it's always, of course, good and useful to have these, these type of workshops and uh, the dialogue going. But I think that's the typical way. Um, yeah. One last question? Yes. 
So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky enough then uh, to work a bit together with you and also yeah. with Yurin, and I'm trying to think how we can link yeah. the science from uh, all of your uh, presentations and talks. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, if you think about the dynamic uh, climate changes that you are studying, and which may be more profound in certain high latitude areas than others, or so more frequent heat waves in certain areas, and not many changes in other areas. And I think the Kermakos community is looking at kind of background temperature changes, but not potential additional effect from these yeah. extremes. Um, so, no, I think it's a really good point, and um, I kind of regretted that I uh, I didn't cover uh, Rebecca's work in here. But these um, these these type of waves they can also actually strongly affect, uh, for example, here eastern Siberia. Uh, and we uh, Rebecca Scholte has done a paper on the combination of snow retreats and these type of wave patterns. How that can uh, create these uh, big wildfires there that we've seen in recent years. Yeah, so yeah, last week there was this uh, permafrost meeting, and I uh, I wasn't there, but I, I happened to have chatted with some people. Uh, Moritz, for example, I uh, got to know him. And my understanding is that indeed for permafrost type estimates, <laughs> uh, the extremes and the heat the heat waves are not fully accounted for. So that would be a very interesting and important topic, I think. Maybe something we can all sit together with. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. Yeah, yeah we have one more question. Yes, I have a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for your interesting presentation. Sure. Um, so in the beginning of the meeting, one of you mentioned that scientists tend to underestimate the, uh, the impact of climate change in their, in their reports. Uh, can you attribute this to their conservative way of reporting, or is it because the climate models are not working? Uh, if I may go first, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I think we always knew that uh, like the IPCC climate models, which is, are the CMIP-6 models, yeah, so these are roughly 20 different, uh, different climate models maintained at different institutes around the globe. And these are fairly coarse resolution. And so um, a typical climate model nowadays is still uh, maybe 80 kilometers uh, block cells. Uh, so you can imagine like the Netherlands, it's, it's just a few, <laughs> it's just a few blocks, right? And extremes. So we always knew, we certainly knew that for rainfall extremes, they are not good. Uh, we knew that. We, we kind of hoped <laughs> That they would be good for heat waves, which are big events and droughts, but um, but we also had our doubts <laughs> that they that they would be good enough. And now we're seeing that at least in some locations, and that the observations are going faster than the model projections. So in general, for global mean temperature estimates, the models are reasonable, and they get things like Arctic amplification and uh, these large scale phenomena and land warming faster than, than ocean. Um, but now we see, uh, yeah, now we're, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a crisis, uh, I guess, in the, the climate modeling community that, you know, what can we still trust in our models right now? Uh, I, I briefly introduced ENZO. ENZO is super important for extremes, for drought around the globe. Um, the models all, all go have a trend towards El Nino. The observations drives to La Nina. This is also a puzzle that we don't understand. So I think uh, the models were all, always too conservative and we were kind of aware of these biases, but now we really see it. <laughs> and we see that the, the trend is going too fast. And then in, in addition, and I think that's what you are raising, is that especially big consensus seeking activities like the IPCC tend to be quite conservative. And then you, you need to find the, you know, let's find the consensus in this room. <laughs> and then uh, it's, it, um, maybe the high end risks will be removed uh, when we find the consensus. But the IPCC reports is a consensus between uh, thousands of scientists. That, that tends to have an, uh, yeah, 
that that, that uh, the messages get rather conservative, and it also means that every IPCC report of case climate change has developed further. We all our models are also getting better, and in every IPCC report, the message tends to be uh, stronger. That's my opinion. Yeah, if I may add, I think it's also our general modesty of like we're scientists, yeah, yeah. we believe yeah. facts, and so that adds up to the things you say. And I think I also worry in a bit because yeah, I see your worry presenting all of these things. So in a, we are more unsure about what, what we know. But yeah. but that that level of insecurity should not be translated into we don't really know what's happening sure. to the yeah. public because we really know what's happening. Is it could just be much worse yeah. than we think, something like that. But it, it's really this between yeah. scientists and media and 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 yeah. It's tricky. It's, I think actually this is a great example of why we have the center. So first the point is we already have a new project, which is good. <laughs> so that's when you bring together people in the room. I think it's also to show that our scientists actually really enjoy doing their research. I think most of you have talked very passionately and very informative about what you do. But also showing, of course, that what we do here isn't just la pula. It's not just because we like the science. It's because we have some important messages. I just want to really support what Jorin said. I think the overall picture that we see is that for what reason or whatever, I think we're all still a bit delusional about what we actually see in the data. And I'm not saying, you know, it's it's surprising us uh, on all fronts, but it's surprising us on many fronts, also because there are feedbacks, as we talked about, there are aggregate effects, and there's a lot of actions by humans that can actually make things worse. I mean, putting those dams in the Libya example is a really good example of that. So this all means we have to not only do more research, we have to talk more about it. We also have to bring more disciplines together to actually understand all the unknowns that we know and probably discover some unknown unknowns. And that is why we're now formally opening our uh, climate well, expertise see. center. And I do it from here. I don't think I will need to come up there. But just saying we have some food outside. At